Welcome back to a Celtic state of mind. It's Friday afternoon. We've got a full house. Mm. It's Lloyd Patrick Jepson, James French, Jim Orr, Brian Degnan. Welcome to the show, guys. Loads to discuss. Um, yeah, we're kind of getting over Lloyd. I think the uh, the Lazio game the other night, so disappointing. But I think when I listen to the Axon bulletins uh, since Wednesday night, it's been you know a situation where we're trying to look at the positives because there are. There's quite a lot of positives coming from not just the Lazio game, the Feyenoord game beforehand. It's easy to say we've lost two games, but I think there are positives in there, Lloyd. Yeah, there's definitely is. I've been just looking at the highlights of both games, actually, and taking the positives out of myself. We have competed so far yeah. at this level. It's just obviously we've not got the points on the board, which is a shame. I know. And we said, tongue-in-cheek, half-joking, James, that uh, your main man, Liam Scales, uh, almost won the game. I say almost, it went flying over the bar with <clears> an overhead scissor kick. I never thought I would see the day in a Champions League game where we're looking at Scales to do that. Um, how impressed were you with Liam Scales the other night? Yeah, listen, I think, again, Liam Scales really stepped up to the play. Um, Final or the way was obviously a really tricky test for him, but Lazio obviously would... You think it'd be of a higher quality, and especially with a mobile out front, he's what a striker like. But um, yeah, listen, I thought Liam Scales was really impressive again. Passing his tackling, just spot on. Being honest, um, he's included in the Ireland squad now, so he's he's got what he he's definitely got what he deserved there. But um, yeah, I think it, it'll be really interesting when well, Carter Vickers obviously came on the other night, mm. but even when Naraki comes back, what will be the situation with Scales Naraki? I don't know what. Who Rogers will kind of um, who we prefer, but I think definitely it's it's his shirt to keep at the moment. Yeah, I'd agree with that, and I hope he does get a game against uh, Greece, Gibraltar, or both of those teams in the international break. It would be great to see him getting the, the full international honours. I'm going to come to you, Jim. You've been watching Celtic in Europe for a long time. Yes, there's a there's a a feeling of Groundhog Day. We're licking our wounds, but I I maintain that there's lots to be positive about. And the other night, it was on a knife's edge, Jim. It could have gone either way. Yeah, I mean, I think when the Champions, Law, Champions, Champions League draw was made, we thought, well, we've avoided the big guns, eh, the Man Cities and the Bayern Munich this world. Okay, we're a pop four team, but there's three teams we've got a chance of taking points off, particularly at home. Eh, to echo Lloyd's point there, up to the sending off against Feyenoord, it was a dead-even game. The other mm. night, we actually were the better team. I think they, they maybe shaded the first half, but we... Totally bossed that second half. Uh, I thought we were great. I thought we were great collectively, tactically, uh, a few really good individual performances as well. If we don't have VAR, Palmer's goal stands, and we're all talking about what a fantastic European performance, how brilliant we were, blah, 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 blah. And as you see, I mean, they are fine margins. And it's the finest of fine margins with Maida's boot. And their goal, and I'm still not convinced about their goal because I saw a photograph yesterday, and you're looking at the six-yard line and drawing a line thinking, well, that looks offside to me. I've not actually seen a photograph that shows the six-yard line and the 18-yard line with another line getting drawn. So these are the fine margins. The referee as well. I mean, on a different night, a different referee sends a guy off for the for the full Hitati. Uh, I love the Champions League games because you go there with, with hope rather than expectation. You know, you're hoping that they can do something because of the quality of the opposition that you're playing. It's kind of like a game of chess. And you know that uh, the concentration levels have to be really, really high because one mistake, you're going to get punished. And uh, I'm always shattered after the game. So goodness knows what the players are like. I mean, you're kind of like mentally concentrating. Don't make a mistake. Give it to him. Give it to that. But I thought I thought we were really good. And maybe, maybe they had that wee bit of extra quality, composure, experience right at the death. They just did us. And the same way we did Motherwell last Saturday, because Motherwell were well worth a point yeah. last Saturday. I thought they played really well tactically, individually, collectively. And they'd <clears> have been gutted as well. But we had that wee extra bit, I think, of quality and composure that, that won us the game last week. And, uh, and although the, the reaction in social media is what you'd expect, I thought it was you know disappointing. Yeah, and people talk about, oh, we've done this, we've, we've, we've seen this movie before. But you can't blame the guys other night. For that, that's a different, that's a bigger discussion. And yeah, we've talked about the signing policies, and, and I've said before, yeah, I think a bit more experience would certainly help us. But we're the better team the other night. So whether we two or three new players who were better, we should have won the game, fine margins. But I've been encouraged 
by the two European performances, much more than domestic performances, which I think have been absolutely pretty average, including Motherwell last week, including Livingston, including all the games, pretty average. But in Europe, I think we've certainly stepped up to the plate against far better opposition. So hopefully we can kick, we can kick start the domestic stuff. And I know we're <laughs> seven points clear after seven games, which is, which is fantastic. But a lot of that's to do with the fact that across the road, there's imploding. You know, they've not been playing well and not getting points. We've not been playing well but getting points. Mm-hmm. And we've not been scoring many goals. We've not been making many chances. But we're winning games. And a lot of that's down to the defence. And the aforementioned Liam Scales has played a major part in that. So I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about domestic stuff after. But in terms of Wednesday night, in terms of the two European games, dead encouraging, really encouraging. You know this, Jim, when you mentioned an implosion, I've seen a, a hint of a smirk on three faces on that screen there. Um, I'm going to come to you, Brian. It was one of those nights where we had built ourselves up and for massive periods of that game, I did have the belief that Celtic were going to actually win. Um, as Jim says, and that, that word yesterday, we were going to add it onto the band list, margins, because we're using it all the time to describe Celtic in Europe. But it is, you know, the laces of a boot. You know, it really is the laces of a boot. And uh, Palmo scores that goal and it's going to be difficult for anybody to come back. But one of the the other matters that I think has slightly gone under the radar, certainly wasn't discussed in a massive way on the night with various replays and all this kind of stuff, was the Hatati, um, you know, for me it was a red card, 100%. And at that point, you're up not one nothing. you get the red card, the whole game changes for you and it's a different night entirely. And I think that's what we're trying to get at, Brian. We're not clutching at straws here. We're not, we're not looking at it and thinking, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for positives because we've got to. I actually do see improvement in the side, the mentality, the approach to a game like the other night. And yeah, we didn't win the game and we did win the game back in 2019. But this is a team who last season were second in Serie A. People keep going on about, oh, they're 16th. Didn't they beat Napoli not that long ago? They've got quality throughout the side. They've got a great gaffer as well. So lots to be positive about, I would suggest, Brian. Yeah, I mean, in one hand, it does feel slightly like we're in a time walk because I remember we're having these conversations after the last Champions League campaign. We're saying the positives are really good. We just can't quite get the results. The positives are really good. We just can't quite get the results. And to be fair, I think, you know, you spoke about margins, but the other end was his mentality. And I think to... To go into the Champions League, knowing that we're we're outmatched. I mean, any most teams in the Champions League are outmatching us on the park, but to compete the way we did, I thought was really impressive. And they keep going and keep trying to play. And I thought we were brave. I thought we were brave in how we approached it. You know, even when we were defending, we never really sat in, we always looked to try and counter quickly. Um and yeah, so I think we can it's hard because you want to be you're pleased because you look at the players in the park, but it is also frustrating. But I think we kind of have to have a bit of a reality check as well in where we are as a club and as a team and what are we expecting for these Champions League campaigns. And I think that, yeah, on the night, I feel like we would have won because of who we were playing. But it's no shame in losing it seems like this, and especially by these fine margins. And I spoke about it last season, about incremental improvement every year you're in there. Yeah. And that's always sort of faulted a little bit when we change manager. Because it's my issues with the continuity at board level and, and the infrastructure because it feels like we're starting again all the time. Mm-hmm. But if Brendan's here for three years, then we, we see what the lessons we can learn, see where the gaps are, improve and move forward for, for next year, hopefully. And I think as well, just to add to it, that, uh, that's the best performance we've put in our season, I think. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, maybe that that sort of, that, that control we are playing is a bit of a drop off the Ange ball, and I think it's made us adjust a wee bit and sort of to oh, it's a bit slow paced, a bit plodding. But actually, I think it's it's taking control of games, and I think it's going to serve as well in Europe. Maybe not this season, unfortunately, but I think moving forward, we're in a good path. And he is here for three years. That that's right, Brian. That's no change, and he guaranteed us that he's here for three years. So and if Brendan Rodgers guarantees it, he wouldn't ever go back to his word. So hundred percent, hundred percent. So we can see that improvement, that incremental improvement mm-hmm. over the three-year period. I'm going to get some of the thoughts in of the commenters. Thanks everybody for getting involved. Or. Touching 600 strong on this Friday afternoon. Some of us will be in Glasgow later on tonight. 
for Chris Sutton live with a Celtic state of mind. What would you ask Chris Sutton? Let us know in the comments. Feel what would you ask the uh, the apparent worst signing in Chelsea's history? Oh, that one came back to haunt him. And I'll tell you what, I think Chris had a bookmarked tweet ready um, to fire out during the week when the news of Michael Beale's uh, downfall was announced. So here we go. Jungle Lion still reckons skills should be playing at left back. There's a few things that I think are going to be interesting in that starting mm -hmm. lineup when it is announced against Kilmarnock. Ed Janzio, hail hail from Halifax. I don't think we've seen you up on the screen, Ed. So welcome to the show. And one uh, podcast, fellow podcast who we have seen up on the screen is certainly Celtic down under. There you go. Full house today. Hail hail from Australia. Brilliant. What time will it be over there where Jared is? It'll be night time, won't it? It'll be night time, ready for bed. Tuning into a wee bit of yaks on before bedtime. Super. Xander Mac, it's like looking at a notice board in a cop shop. Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's a piece fair. That's not, that's absolutely fair. That's it absolutely is. fair. Aye, and the big question is, who done it? Let us know in the comments section who actually was the uh, person responsible for the crime. Matt O'Reilly, I want to start off with Matt O'Reilly. Um, sorry, I've not been able to hide my uh, admiration and adoration for this man in recent times, Lloyd. He goes out there again the other night, and I thought it, it was a very accomplished European performance for a player. It's easy to forget that he was playing third-tier English football two seasons ago, something like that, a couple of years ago. He uh, goes out there, and I thought he was brilliant. Um, not picked for the Danish squad, which raised a few eyebrows, but continues to improve under Brendan Rodgers, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. He's... Once again, you're looking to build up to the goal, just the slight pass through the field and that as well. It's what a football he's turned into. But I thought me and you, you were in a queue actually. For the ad admiration of Matt O'Reilly. I thought it was at the front yet, but it seems you've just put me to it now. I've leapfrogged you. I've leapfrogged you've just leapfrogged you. me, actually. Oh, sure. yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. And obviously I'm I'm on the bulletin with JP on a Thursday. He's a close personal friend of the O'Reilly's now, so <laughs> That helps in my favour as well. Uh, James, uh, he's a guy who we are witnessing the development of a player um, who obviously we've seen it since the day came in. Actually, I thought he was one of these guys, to use another uh, cliche, hit the ground running. And he just continues to improve. But I don't know what it is, but Brendan Rodgers seems to be getting more out of him. And and I think that's what Brendan's forte is, isn't it? The, the fact that he's able to man-manage and develop individuals like Matt O'Reilly. Yeah, 100%. I think Matt O'Reilly's game has been elevated to a new level, really, since uh, Rogers came in. I seen him um, tweet the other day saying Matt O'Reilly kind of has the, the technique of Tom Rogic and uh, the power and kind of goal scoring ability of Stuart Armstrong. I thought that was spot on. I think there he's, he's kind of a mix of the two of them. And he's, yeah, I think he's probably better than the two of them as well. But yeah, I, I was shocked that he wasn't included in the Denmark um, squad. Now. I think even a lot of the Denmark national team fans were expecting him to be in the squad with his form. And uh, that performance in the Champions League against a team with a calibre like Lazio will definitely not have, um, not have helped their chances of keeping hold of them in the summer because there'll be a lot of um, sewers across Europe looking at that performance last night in terms of just overall midfield play, his pass, and his, his, um, even his defensive work. I thought that triangle of midfield, I thought McGregor, O'Reilly, Leicester saw so that. I thought um, he had some really good moves and... Uh, yeah, I think O'Reilly, listen, he's, he's in really good form and hopefully continues now for the rest of the season. Yeah, and uh, I'm pretty sure he, that he's eligible for a few other nations and they're going to be looking at that situation very closely, Jim. Um, still a young a young pup. I agree with James. I, I, we'll get on to that, Tati. I don't think he's hit his stride yet, but uh, Matt O'Reilly certainly has stepped up and um, none more so than natural move. That's how you cut through a quality defence. It doesn't matter what, your, what quality of your opposition is. That the, the three-man Maeda, O'Reilly, with a wee cushion pass, Kyogo getting in behind a defender. You can cut anybody open with a, a, with a quality move like that, Jim. Great goal, man, great goal. But I think yeah, it's still early days in the season. We're only in a couple of months. I think, you know, let's let's get to Christmas and we'll see how much done. It's been a great start to the season. He's scoring goals this season, which he didn't do much last season. So uh, I think the system suits him. Mm -hmm. In much the same way, I think it doesn't suit Kyogo. This system, Kyogo looks a bit isolated and a bit lost. I'm not making many chances, but the system seems to suit Matt O'Reilly. It lacks a bit of pace. I mean, if he had pace, he'd be like, you know, he wouldn't be here if he had pace. And that was the thing the other night, I think. I mean, what we have to do is like a bit more pace in that midfield because when Lazio broke, they broke at pace. They were mm -hmm. really, really fast. And all of a sudden, we were in trouble. Whereas, although we kind of bossed the second half, it was kind of slow and laborious. We were the better team. We bossed the game. 
But when you're playing that kind of slow, then the opposition will get guys back. And they're a good team and no space at the back. So I think, I don't know if you work on your speed, but certainly he's put, he's made a really good start to the season. Let's see what we play like Christmas. Let's see if he scored another you know, five or six goals by Christmas and he keeps that level up because uh, you can... Most players can do things over a month or two, but you know, come come the end of the season, let's hope he is the player of the season and, he, and he's kept it going. But he's been a great start. Let's see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, really good player. Mm. I, I was looking at his stats, Brian, uh, because last season a lot of the chat was around the lack of goals. He got his goal really late in the season. Um, he's already scored more this season than he did last. But in his first campaign, he obviously came to Celtic in the January. But the combined goals of that MK Don stroke Celtic season, I think he scored 11. He was in double figures, obviously, playing um, third-tier English football for part of that season. But he is someone that you can you can quite visibly see is improving season on season. I'm not just putting it down to Brendan Rodgers. I think he was better second season round other than the goals than he was for the first half season. And he just keeps improving incrementally. The big uh, challenge for us, as James said earlier on, you put in a performance like that in the Champions League, the Vultures will be circling Celtic Park come January and the summer. Yeah, that's right. But I suspect that's why he's been given a, a bumper new contract for a few years on it. Because if there is vulture circling, then we're going to get top dollar or we should certainly be asking for it. I was a big defender of Matt Riley last year when he was got a bit of criticism because I thought he was excellent at the Champions League last year, especially when he had to deputise as the number six for Callum. I thought he really showed his versatility. And I've said a few things that I think he's got the highest ceiling of potential at the squad. I think he'd be like, you know, he's 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 height, his physicality, his defensive work's massively underrated. He can pick a pass and now he's added goals that sort of tying into the box. He's 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 going to be, you know, well um, coveted come the summer. Um, and unfortunately that's Celtic's model. So, you know, it could be the case that if we get the right price, we have to let him go. But what we need to do is maximise what we've got with these guys at the time and and and, and do well. And it's interesting actually that the system, Jim mentioned the system benefiting O'Reilly. Um, I think it's it's it doesn't seem to be benefiting Hatati. I still don't think this is. I have to I have to dip off it when I talk here. Somebody a controversial point at first, but I I think Hatati's had a bit of stinker this season. I know he was injured a wee bit, but I don't think he's had a good game so far. And I think he was guilty of a lot of loose passing and, and poor ball retention and final darned against uh, Lazio. So it'd be interesting if you know. If home hadn't been suspended, or if you know, maybe there's a, a change for that, or maybe Bernardo was up to speed for the weekend. Um, but I think I think Hitati needs a wee bit of time to adjust to this. Now, the flip side of that is he always gives you something that no one else does. He's always got that sort of maverick, almost almost Maratic esque quality that he can sort of pull something out. But I think I think the, 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 you can see there's a, a dynamic shift to last season to this season in terms of who's benefiting for this system, who isn't. Hmm. I think Taylor was struggling at first, but they've been smart enough to adopt him and let him go inverted, and he's been he's been doing fairly well, although he got targeted on the left hand side, which again I think was because Hattati wasn't defending. So uh, as much as O'Reilly's been good, I think the system's no benefit to others. And Jim Hiley's in Kyogo, but I think Hattati's worth mentioning as well. I'm going to I also maybe just to finish on Matt O'Reilly. I think if the managers hadn't changed, he might not be here. Because he obviously wasn't happy last year. He wasn't getting a game. Aaron Moy was getting games ahead of him. Hitati was on fire. He don't drop Callum McGregor. So he wasn't a first pick. And I think he might have left if Andrew stayed. And it was interesting that he made one of the comments earlier on in the season about the fact the manager talks to them now. And I know we kind of <laughs> we pour over the minutiae of the things, but it's an interesting thing to say the fact that he came out and said that. It's almost like the last manager didn't talk to me. He also didn't play me as well. So I think if we hadn't changed manager, I think he might not have been here. Well, Maybe you can say the same for Abada as well, Jim. I think Abada, everyone had him leaving mm -hmm. pretty much, yeah. with, with, written him off. And then, so it's yeah. just, as they say, different strokes for different folks. We've used Slain a few doors. Of, absolutely. Doors, the, right. the, the word margin, but Brian's now brought another M word in, in, the, in the, the model. I want to have a wee chat about the model. And, you know, is it possible for that three years that Brennan Rogers has pledged to the club um, not to completely change the model? Because obviously Jim Jim's a figures man and he knows that obviously we need to, we, we do have to work the, the transfer 
and recruitment strategy to our advantage, but maybe to massage it a wee bit to to try and keep key players at the club and add to those key players with, with other people who can make an instant impact. It's something that I, I will continue to talk about until we change the model, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Paddy Lavery, afternoon all from a soggy Ardoin. I'm sorry the sun is not shining. Uh, Martin Davey asked Chris Sutton tonight, was Larson always better than Shearer on his day? I will ask him that question. Um, and Mamansis Hatati is a man down in Champions League just now. Two dreadful performances. Give Bernardo a chance on Saturday. Bernardo has impressed in the cameos that he's made. Lloyd, I'm going to come to you. Let's move on to Rio Hatati then, right? So, <clears throat> you know what? He took a, a, a smack in the face against Motherwell and he took another one against um, Lazio the other night. I'm not saying this is what his bad performances are down to. Uh, because I don't think he's shown the form we would expect all season, to be fair. I thought when he came on against Aberdeen at Petordre, he looked really up for it and he was making things happen, then he got injured. So it's been a, a difficult campaign for him so far. There's no doubt he has a quality Lloyd, right? Do you think it's a case of him not really fitting into the system? What's Brendan Rodgers going to do with him to get that form back? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, that one. I do think it is mainly down to the system. I, d- I do think he's struggling a bit with it. With trying to get up to speed, obviously he's still coming back for fitness well, from his injury. So it's do you, do you risk dropping Hatati on the basis for someone else coming into that team and maybe then they kick on and then Hatati is just sitting on the bench because Hatati, no matter what, we all know his quality. Mm-hmm. We know he is one of our best players on his day, and I just don't know if this system is going to suit him down the line. Well, we've looked at the system that Brendan has implemented and he has changed it. He's changed it slightly with Greg Taylor, um, even to a degree with Joe Hart, because I don't think instantly we changed what Hart was doing. Remember the friendly game over in Japan where Hart messed up and we conceded a really weak goal because he was doing that thing that we saw over the previous two seasons where he was labouring the possession at his feet, etc. And he lost a goal. I think that that's changed and I think that the uh, inverted fullbacks have changed back to what they were before. So Brendan could well adapt it. Uh, James, I'm going to come to you and ask you the same question about Rio Atati. And the last comment that came up, um, throwing Bernardo in, I just think I've still got one eye on the Kilmarnock defeat earlier on in the season. Circumstances are different. It's at home. I get it. Um, I would much rather let Hatati play through this and regain the form through playing games and continuing to play games. Yeah, listen, obviously Rio Tata not being um, not being in the best of form this season and was was poor against Lazio uh, during the week. But I think the mate around Atate is his ball retention has always kind of been questionable, even under Ange. Um, he, he obviously really suited the way Ange played, but Atate takes risks on the ball. It's just the player he is, and unfortunately, he's gonna his ball his ball retention isn't good enough. And um, being honest. Oh, Rogers um obviously talked at the start of the season that Hattie needs to improve other areas of his game tactically specifically I think Rogers said and I think he will need to do that if he wants to thrive in in Rogers system but uh he at Hattie gives you something that we don't really have with other midfielders and I kind of agree with Paul I think you kind of you let him play through it and adapt to the system and you you kind of have to give him cut him a bit of slack really like he was obviously out injured at the start of the year. Um, and even if you look at the amount of games he's played over the last year and a half, even coming from Japan, it's it's ridiculous. Like so, I think you just kind of have to cut a bit of slack. I know it hasn't been good enough recently, but I think you, you play him play through play him through it. And if if Bernardo is impressing and maybe Turnbull are at home, maybe home comes back in, then you maybe give one of them a chance. But definitely for the moment, I think Atate he's, he's still in our best team. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But in terms of the game this weekend, then, Jim Moore, Jim Moore, I'll come to you and ask you the question. Um, we've obviously got the, the three-man midfield, uh, Callum McGregor, Matt O'Reilly, who we've discussed. And for me, Hatate on his day would be in there every single every single game. However, there are options. James has just mentioned a few of the options. Do we stick with Hatate against Kelly? Do we bring in Young Home? Does someone else get drafted in? Bernardo's there. Turnbull's there. What do you think Brendan will do? I kind of echo James's comments. He cut Hattati a bit of slack. I mean, last season for me, he was our best player. Uh, he was injured at the start of this season. It's a new system. He misses Jota. He misses Jota. Because basically, you watch Celtic play, Hattati will take that position just beyond the halfway line on the left-hand side and he's got Jota in front of him. And he knows, I'll give it to Jota, he'll give it back to me. 
playing with Maida or Yang or Palmer, it's no particularly working. Uh, no, it's, it's their fault. But Jota was an exceptional player. Jota would make moves, etc. So no Jota in the team affects Hatati. Mm. New system affects Hatati. Injuries affect Hatati. Potentially being transferred when a new contract affects Hatati. So I think there's lots of reasons why he's maybe not at it just now. And as, as James said, you need to cut him some slack. And he's the opposite of Matt O'Reilly. He hasn't made a great start to the season, but let's wait till we get to December to let's see where Rio Hatati is at that point in time. You always play your best team. I think the issue we have with such a huge squad, how do you guys get game time? So mm-hmm. Bernardo, you know, you, you, he's hardly kicked a ball. You know, he's come on, did one or two B cameos, and you can't read much into that. Mm-hmm. Home has looked quite good, but some pieces. David Turnbull scored some goals. If you're saying that Cal Mack and Mark O'Reilly are kind of stick ons, you've only won more place in the team if you play that system. If you went for the midfield, Maybe you get a chance to maybe vary it a wee bit because there's been some talk about maybe having a uh, Kyogo and Maeda up front to maybe vary it a wee bit. So it's a huge squad, which makes it really difficult. But always play your best team. Uh, you would say on current form, Hatati is not in the best team and you give someone else a chance. So it's a difficult one for the manager. Uh, I'd stick with Hatati because he's the guy, as James said, he takes risks and that's what we need. And I think, as I alluded to earlier, I think in the last third this season, domestically, poor, really poor. Haven't tested goalkeepers very much. Uh, and I think we've been, <laughs> I think the last couple of games, we've been thrown a bit by what's happened in game. You can down to 10 main, mm. siege mentality, masterclass by the manager. It was great to win the game. It could have been a potential banana skin, but when Livingston, for goodness sake, you know, we've got a fraction of our resources. So we should be beating them even, even with 10 men. But winning with 10 men, you think, well, we're with 10 men. It's brilliant. We didn't play that well. Last week, we were really, really poor, I thought. No intensity, no tempo, created no chances at all. But when you score a goal in the way we did in the last seconds of the game, that gets masked a wee bit. It was a poor performance. Motherwell deserved a point. But didn't. Because you're thinking, no, no, a few minutes to go, we're going to drop two points here. Come five o'clock, we're only two points ahead. It's a disaster. Come five o'clock, we're seven points ahead. And everything's brilliant. Mm-hmm. But you have to take a wee step back and say, well, look at that performance. Was it good enough? No, it wasn't really because Motherwell deserved the point. So we need to do better than that. And I think you can go through most domestic games this season. Well, you win the Ibrox Park. That, that buys you so much goodwill. So much goodwill that you can maybe ignore some of the things that's happening. I just think we've been, compared to last season, certainly, in that final... That's my concern. It's only called Marnock and it's the Celtic part. We kind of said that with St. Johnson a few weeks ago. We said that with Dundee and it took a penalty in the second half to open them up. You know, So whether the teams are getting a bit better, whether their system isn't conducive to actually making a lot of chances, I don't really know. But I think we have to get that right. That's a fair point, Jim, because it's easy, um, especially the other night, like, some of the guys are saying there, we did probably put in our best performance of the season. So you you, you then Definitely. tend to think we're getting the wins against um, other, you know fellow league clubs, but the performances haven't been swashbuckling. Barry O'Sullivan says key for tomorrow is tempo, tempo, yes. tempo. Are we going to yes. get that though under Brendan? What do you reckon, Brian? Is that the type type of game we're going to get under Brendan Rogers? Yes and no. I think I think in general, passing needs to be quicker anyway. Even within Rogers' system, I've been a bit more sort of pragmatic. I still think they pass the ball quicker. They yeah. unlock. Um, and, and, and on that, like I think Hitati will start tomorrow. I think he should. I think for the SPFL, he's, he's great. My, and I think for Europe, it will be good. My concern, I think Hitati goes back to, you know, if Ted Taylor is a bit of a weak spot in Europe, which we know, and we love Greg Taylor, he's great, but it is a weak spot. And Hitati's not defending it. And you've not made it in the left side back. That's why we keep getting targeted. So I'd be a bit more support. You can have a player like that at that level. But if we're about a couple of areas we're, we're weaker in, I, I think we need to rethink how we approach Europe. But in, in terms of uh, the Kamalak game, I think Katati has to start, which sounds like a contradiction. But we, we need that creativity because it's a different different game entirely because they're going to sit in and, and pack the box and try and counter. So you need someone who can, can do that unpredictable thing and we're not going to be under as much pressure defensively so his requirements to track back and chase back and press aren't as, as essential so I think it's a really good game for him 
And again, I'm not suggesting he's only good enough for the SPFL. I just think in Europe we need to rethink how we use him until we get a, a more a stronger option at left back or um, at left wing, depending where Mead is playing. But I need to drop off just now, guys. Happy no Friday. Problem. Great Thanks to see you. See Superb. You Catch Cheers. you next week. Next one. And um, we will hear from Brian again next week. It's always a pleasure for him to dial in from the Swindon Shamrock. Um, was it something we said? Was it something it was. we said? He's had enough. He's just had enough, Jim. That's it. Who was that guy? I know. Um, let's watch. We will be talking about the girls' fantastic start to the season under Fran Alonso. Les Watts, I think he's done really well, and he's done well in the transfer market as well. Um, Stuart Ramsey, afternoon, Axel, and all my fellow Tims. Hail, hail from a sunny West Midlands. And is that a wee set of drums there as well? As well, Stuart, let us know. Um, and Barry O'Sullivan, again, nice to see all the boys on today. And just at that, Brian drops off for the rest of the day. The, the day. Xander Mack, I, whatever could you be meaning? The banter years are turning into the banter of decades. Um, and uh, Cyprus is green and white. What could it be meaning, Lloyd? Did you enjoy Cy that last night? What happened last night? I, I know Cyprus is a lovely place and lovely people there, but I, I don't have a clue what happened last night. No. No, I don't pay much attention to neither did they. No, exactly. Jim, are we? I mean, obviously, the banter years, etc. Uh, we obviously get uh, a bit of stick from the other side on the show from time to time. That's all fair and well. I try to look at things on the, the perspective of Celtic. What does it mean for Celtic? Um, it, it, you know, I would suggest at this moment in time that uh, they are in a particularly bad way, they're in bad shape, Jim. And uh, Celtic can't rest on our laurels in that respect. I think we've done that in the past. I think there's maybe a, a criticism in the transfer window just gone that we've done something similar in terms of European aspirations. But it is important, Jim, obviously to do it in a balanced way, but to continue to progress without just trying to keep a whisker ahead of the opposition. Yeah, I mean, I think them having a new manager coming in will, will give them a bit of a boost. I think they've got... They've got some decent players over there. They've just underperformed, I think. And you talk about fine margins and the game last Saturday, Ibrox did about four chances in the first 20 minutes. You know, they scored one or two of them. It's a different game again for them. So I don't, I don't, you know, that. Watch what I say. <laughs> I think that they've got some, some, some decent players and under a decent manager, they'll do okay. And they'll, and they'll beat the other teams. That's the thing. That's the thing about when you've got a two horse race, uh, you're going to gather points and it's, down to the head-to-heads, and, and that's what made that winning at Ibrox so huge the other week. Uh, given the resources of the two clubs, they should always be winning games, but you, you have to be wary of the odd slip-up, and they've, and they've slipped up a couple of times so far, and we slipped up once, so we can't do that again. We, we, we just take care of business ourselves, we'll be OK. If we play to our potential, then we win every game we play. And that's why I love the Champions League nights, because... I mean, you're going to the game tomorrow thinking, well, we should win this game. If we don't win this game, it's a bit of a disaster. You know, if we don't win the game other night, it's not a disaster, it's disappointing. Mm. But we didn't go there with expectation. We went with hope in our hearts, as the song goes. You know, so, yeah, I mean, we've got a huge squad. We've got a first-class manager. We've got resources that other teams are miles away from. So, that, and again, it's down to 11 versus 11, and footballers are human and all this kind of stuff. But if the manager... Uh, uh, manages to his full ability and the players play to their full ability, then we win the league, certainly from a position of being seven points ahead. No complacency at all. Don't take any games lightly and always play your strongest team and never talk about, well, one eye on whenever it's going to be. Forget that. Play your strongest team. And that's what I think is difficult for the manager, given he's got such a big squad. I mean, one of these players could come in the team and become a first-team regular. Mm. Another thing I find interesting is the fact that the two guys we've got on loan, you wonder what the contract says for the, for the two guys in terms of how they must play. Are they meant to play X number of games, X number of starts? Phillips at the back, I mean, on current forum, uh, you keep in scales, obviously, and you bring back big Carter Vickers, you have to bring back, but is there, a, is there a, something in the contract for Phillips that says he has to play a certain amount of games? You, you bring this guy in at the last minute and they don't play him at all. Bernardo's the same. You wonder whether there's some in the contract for them as well. So, difficult thing to manage, but it's all about getting three points in the board for the manager. No, I think it's a great point you make, and it will lead us into the central defensive um, discussion as well. Jungle Lion says, big goal for Rodgers tomorrow with the two centre-halves. Yeah. It absolutely is. I think we were in such a, 
precarious situation with Phillips coming in as an emergency loan that we might have agreed to something, Lloyd. And that that is sometimes unfortunate, particularly when you're kind of forced to play a player who's on loan. I know that loads of loan deals have that written into it. You've got to play them uh, a percentage of the time or the loan fee. You know, there's a trigger in the loan fee and you have to pay more money, etc. Um, Phillips, I could see that being in the deal because we were not in a good situation when we went to try and bring him up from Liverpool. Um, but it opens a discussion. We started the other night, Lloyd. It was Phillips and it was Scales. And I think they were doing well. It was pretty clear to me looking at it that before the game, they wanted Phillips to get an hour in his legs and then they were bringing Carter Vickers on. Anyway, you could just tell that that was the plan. And Carter Vickers comes in, um, big applause. Everybody's delighted to see him back. The man has been an absolute rock for Celtic at the back. And you would never have thought for a moment he was the guy to make the mistake. He just seemed kind of ponderous and in possession. And for that moment, you just wish he'd have put his toe through it. Um, I wouldn't have minded that at all. Just get it out of there. And obviously, he's a fall guy. I'm not going to hold it against him. His, his performances have been at such a high standard. That's that's why it was such a shock. But going into the game, uh, Jungle Line says it. It's a big call for Rodgers tomorrow. Um, for me, I think Scales is undroppable. You've got to play him on form. Who partners him? Or, or would you? bring back Carter Vickers and play him alongside Phillips. What do you reckon? Uh, obviously on Carter Vickers coming back, it's good to see him back playing ahead of schedule. That that was always a bonus because I think we were told um, that he would be back after the international break. So that's a bonus. Regarding Nat Phillips though, you kind of look at it now thinking, right, it was a emergency loan deal. He's only played, what, best part of 90 minutes and, and 120 at most out of all the games he's played. So really, is he... Was it really that emergency loan deal that we needed back then? Because we've kind of covered with Lager Belka in Europe mm. and, skills, and skills is just, like you said, he is undroppable at the minute. But the only thing with Carter Vickers for me is I don't want to rush him back too much because I don't want him breaking down and having another injury because he's going to be key for the rest of the season. And a player like Carter Vickers' ability, he's your top defender, so you'd want to rely on him. So with that, I would kind of play Phillips and skills tomorrow just to get rest Carter Vickers a wee bit and then you can maybe bring him on for another two minutes. So you're bedding him back in. I think had Carter Vickers started that game the other night, he would have came to terms with the physicality of the, the last <coughs> players that he was up against. When he ended up getting possession, um, you noticed this, they just swarmed around him, didn't they? They swarmed around him. He hesitated for that moment. And uh, the mistake was made, and obviously we know what happened after that. James, I'm going to come to yourself. Um, scales for me, vast improvement. Even, you know, people are saying they're not surprised because he got all this game time at Aberdeen. James McKenzie watched quite a few of the games that he played at Aberdeen and wasn't that impressed with him last season. We all remember the goal against Rangers and stuff like that. But, you know, he was playing in a very difficult season for Aberdeen. You obviously had the fiasco with Darville and all that. He was part of all that. So for him to come back, yeah, he got the game time. James, but the performances have been largely solid and then improving to such a degree that he's standing out as the, the main centre-half for Celtic. Uh, as I say, I would have loved to have seen him completing the Ralston resurrection because remember Ralston started scoring worldly goals, <laughs> scoring scissor kicks and all that kind of stuff and I thought Skills was going to try his luck against Lazio um, as well. Who's your two centre-halves, James, for the game? Uh, do you agree with Lloyd and that we shouldn't rush Carter Vickers back? Yeah, listen, I think um, if, if Carter Vickers is 100% fit, then he's obviously an option, but do, I don't think it's really a priority to rush him back um, for the weekend. I think kind of you want to keep him, not let him get an injury or anything that'll make him miss any of the rest of the Champions League games. So um, I think definitely Scales and Scales and Phillips for me is uh, would definitely be the two I'd go for. Um, in terms of yeah, Liam, I think... I think people kind of got notions that he was just kind of a bad football player after the, the performance in Norway and the Bodo Klimt game where he was kind of playing left back and mm -hmm. in, in what was a poor enough team and put out uh, in that game. But I think um, he's he's been uh, really proved a lot of people wrong. You know, I'm kind of lean scales at PR, PR team now at this stage. I'll just be able to talk about him. But yeah, listen, he's been, he's been outstanding and um, left side, he's a left side centre half. He offers something that it's a rare commodity now in football, kind of a left-footed centre-half there. there um, even if you look at Man City, the way they brought in Gavardial, it's 
it's really um it's a neat <coughs> kind of role in the game at the moment and he just uh, gives you something different playing out from the back as a left uh, a left footer on the left side of the fence and um long may it continue because um i would really be surprised if he didn't start for ireland now in the upcoming international break um with his form and everything and um that's it's it's a it's an achievement considering ireland's center half options um really is so uh, yeah listen hopefully long may it continues and he can make that jersey his own that would be fantastic i'd love to see it um i mean we we, we do liken his resurrection uh to lazarus himself uh, tony ralston and uh it would like come full circle a wee bit like tony because he ended up getting international recognition and it's great to see skills getting that as well coming up hopefully he, he gets the games he gets the caps against greece and gibraltar as well loads of comments coming in really keen to bring your thoughts into the equation and into the discussion william kennedy carter vickers coming back the same player will take time i get that and colin rogers uh, skills and phillips both got booked in the first half wednesday night so was expected to see carter vickers for the second half uh too early reckons pablo 67 for carter vickers and Donald Matheson on the Facebook. It's no debate, Scales, Carter Vickers, as we have a break following. And it gives a big man time, game time, and then maybe uh, take him off as well. Carter Vickers and Phillips for Will McMillan. If you want to get involved in the chat, all you need to do is subscribe to the channel on YouTube. We are live streaming every weekday and for every single game as well. And we're adding some quality to the channel. We fully produce videos once a week uh, for a wander around paradise and a few other uh, times as well. We've got a um, big interview actually coming up. Uh, we had one this week, didn't we? Willie Hockey interviewing us. Uh, Jim, it was very interesting for a guy like yourself who has a, a real interest in the takeover period at Celtic. Mm. Uh, obviously, we were speaking to Willie uh, in the main to talk about his part in the St. Rocks game coming up in the centenary game. Um, he's going to be managing the Celtic side but uh, hopefully in the future we can get a more deep dive interview about his involvement with the uh, Celtic takeover and bringing Dermot Desmond to the club, etc. It was an interesting, albeit quite a short interview, I, I felt, with Willie Hockey, Jim. Yeah, and Willie Hockey had a huge part to play in the history of Celtic Football Club. And uh, I think he said at the time that there was not just Fergus who was sitting there with a, a bundle of money there to take over the club. Uh, yeah, yeah, good guy, Willie Hockey. I like him a lot. And, and uh, which team is he managing? Is he managing the Celtic team or the St. Rocks team? Celtic. No, I hope he wins then. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and right. you know what? There might be a couple of rabbits pulled out of hats between now and next Sunday, um, mm -hmm. now that, that Willie's on it. Um, right. But the reason I brought that up is we've got a, a very interesting roundtable interview with our special guests who will be appearing live at Don Max at the end of the month. Uh, you might have seen it. It sold out very quickly, actually. Pierre, Andy Tom and um, George Cadet will be over. Very rarely will those three guys be in the same room these days, but they will be for a couple of days uh, due to that gig. And I'm going to take the opportunity to get them to sit down and uh, do a wee interview for the channel. I think that's going to be particularly interesting uh, for those who like um, the idea of us live streaming. The live event is always a wee bit different. We want them to open up and be honest and maybe say things they don't want to be committed to video for the rest of time and share yeah. them amongst the socials. Um, however, we will do it separately. We'll get sat down at Don Max, get, get the boys a wee glass of wine or whatever the tipple is and have a good wee chat. Um, Johnny Ryan, squad has to be trimmed in January. Must be a few unhappy players. That's a great point, Johnny, because going into the last recruitment, into the last uh, transfer window, rather, Lloyd, I wrote the names of 10 players and I've got to admit, sorry, James, in advance, Liam Scales was on it. Guys that we could actually offload out of the squad. And that's changed. It's an ever-changing thing. You know, at the beginning of the season, people would, might have said, I was mad to have David Turnbull on there. Now David's out of the kind of picture. Um, Liam Scales has stepped right up. Stephen Welsh has signed his new contract. But there are still a lot of people not not contributing at the moment, Lloyd. And um, I'm, I'm just of the view that we could probably trim the squad and add a bit of quality rather than add a plethora of projects. Because, I mean, listen, when, when Big Brian was on there and I was asking him about who plays in the midfield, I thought he was going to tell me Quan. I thought he was going to throw Quan into the equation. There's guys that are not contributing. Um, and, I, and I just think that, you know, two or three players' wages and transfer fees could make a difference if you bought that real quality. And I think that's the one thing that's niggling at me about the transfer window just past, Lloyd. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same in that one. Because you look, 
you look at it, the wages that these guys are on, you can bring at least two or three quality players like Joe Art, Kat Vickers, and else even Kyogo into that squad. And it would make a massive difference. I mean, it would make a, a massive difference maybe on Wednesday night as well if these mm-hmm. type of players were brought in. Then you've got Sirius, Awa, Kobe Ashe. There's a fair few names I could rhyme off that just don't contribute anything in a minute. And I don't know if this is because Brendan doesn't fancy him as a player or just like James McCarthy, he's just out of the picture altogether. So yeah. it, it's it's kind of an interesting thing with the window, the January transfer window, because normally you don't see a lot of business getting done. But at this time, I think this squad does need trimmed right down to basically a 16 man squad and then obviously some younger players coming through as well. Well, I, I remember Roger saying that he wants a 17 man core group. Um, you know, the, the kind of long list, if you like, goes to 25. I'm going to bring this one up from Will. Um, skills reckons Will is still the third or fourth choice at present and can easily be dropped. Right. Let's put this out to the team then and let us know in your comments field if you agree with Will. So we've got eight, in essence, we've got eight centre halves at the club at the moment. Carter Vickers, Navrovsky, Lager Bielk, Scales, Welsh, Kobayashi, Phillips, and of course, Awata. Um, who played in the Scottish Cup final last season at centre-half. Now, I'm going to give you my view. You can agree, disagree, uh, or otherwise. I think when all fit, when all fit, I'm playing Carter Vickers and Scales at this moment in time. While I'm at um, while I'm at it, Lloyd, and I've just been speaking to you, what's your view on that? Who's your, who's your first two when everybody's fit? When everybody's fit and on form, it'll be Carter Vickers and Scales for Carter me. Vickers and I, Scales. I don't, I, Scales is just undroppable at the minute. Yeah, why would you drop him? This is the thing. And I know we brought in Novroski. Jimmy looks like a replacement for Starfelt. Same kind of bracket in terms of the transfer fee, albeit a wee bit younger. I get that. Lagerbielk, I thought we brought him in as backup. He's played more games than he might have expected. Kobayashi, it's not worked out. I don't think he's got a future at Celtic. Phillips was an emergency buy. Awata doesn't get much game time. Who do you play if everybody's fit, Jim? I mean, football's all about opinions. And if someone says they're... Scales is third or fourth choice. Based on what? <laughs> Based on what? So who's the, who's the top two? Phillips, who's, as Lloyd says, has played less than 90 minutes and been pretty all right. Narofsky, who didn't look too clever, and his cameo appearance, and Laga Bielka, who's not played as well as Scales. So the evidence at this point in time is Carter Vickers and Scales. And the thing that's interesting about Carter Vickers, for me, as you said earlier, Paul, the guy's a rock, absolute rock. He was carrying an injury before the season started up at Aberdeen. He was the guy that caused the goal up there. He was to blame for that goal. He gave him the other night. He was, it's not about blame, but, but, but basically it's unusual for Carter Vickers to make mistakes. And he made one at mm. Aberdeen and cost the goal. He made one the other night and cost the goal. And that's the thing about needing to be 100% fit. you know. And as fan, you can think, I'll bring him back. He'll be fine. But is he 100% fit physically and mentally? I was watching the, the David Beckham thing Last night, I don't know if you've seen it, watched the first couple of episodes. Brilliant, fascinating thing, brilliant. And Cantona is always talking about the time when Beckham gets sent off against Argentina, and he's like the most mm. hated guy in England, sort of thing. And Cantona was talking about to play football, you have to be 100%. 95% is no good, 100%. And then they were showing clips of Beckham at that time, hitting the ball at the park, and he's been, been all over the place. So you have to be 100% fit. Phillips the other night wasn't 100% fit. Carter Vickers the other night wasn't 100% fit. How do you get fit? You need to play games. Uh, you don't get fit by playing games in Europe. I don't think, because it's too risky. You can play games at home, I think, domestically. So for tomorrow, I said earlier, I would like to see Carter Vickers come back. He needs a bit more minutes. Uh, but in terms of who's the top, this, that and the other, I think you have to go on the evidence of what's happened so far. And the evidence so far, we've not seen enough of Narovsky. Kobayashi got bullied at Ibrox last season, and that kind of yeah. put a bit of a downer on, on him, I think. Iwata's done okay, but I don't like playing people at position. He's a midfield. He's a very good midfield player. And again, he's somebody you think, well, he's due a game. He, he's, done, he's done nothing wrong. And in the games he's come on this season playing midfield, he's been really good. And that's the other thing as fans. You think, well, players are just... You actually don't think players are actual people. You just think they're commodities. You come in and do this and come in and do that. But if you're somebody like Quan, you mentioned Quan here, what's going through his mind? Mm-hmm. I've came halfway around the world, I don't speak the language, I'm not going to sniff of a game. I'm miles away. Oh, Bernardo, come from Benfica, thinking, well, I'll walk into this team. He's got a few minutes here and there. So that's it. mentally, how are they keeping things going? But I would always go on the evidence. You know, let's see what's there. So if Narofsky comes in and plays 10 games, he's outstanding, then he's in the top two, definitely. But he's not kicked the ball. So you can't 
in my opinion, say that he's ahead of skills at this point in time because skills has been outstanding. Longer term, yeah, I don't think skills is the answer. I think he's a better quality than skills, but at this point in time, skills is number one, actually. Never been Carter Vickers. Skills number one. Yeah, and it, like you say, uh, Jim, we've seen it in the past. Purple patches, people go through them. People, you know, they go through a period where they really step up. Um, I remember it, by the way, people might think this is a strange uh, comparison. I remember it with Mike Galloway under Liam Brady. Mike Galloway ended up in the Scotland squad. He played against Romania, um, and he was scoring goals for 25 yards against Dundee United. Um, he was a different type of player to Collins and McStay, but he had a purple patch, and, and players do have that. At this moment in time, no way would I be dropping scales. Neither would John Bosas, but he would marry him up with Lagerbielk. It's all about opinions, of course. Do we even need to ask James French his view on who is the top two centre halves at Celtic right now? James, I'm going to ask it just for the for the balance of the conversation. Um, is it unfair to say that he's third or fourth choice, Liam Scales? Well, yeah, I think James spot on. Football's a game of opinions, but. I think you can have these kind of opinions and takes, but you have to kind of look at the evidence that we have. Um, I really like the look of Naraki since I've seen him. And I think he's kind of the, the bracket of player we should be going after, kind of that five, six million um, pound buy. But I'd, I'd love to see him be given game time when he comes back. But I think at the moment, um, unsurprisingly, you have to say it's Scales and Phillips. But I think even, or, yeah, Scales and Phillips and Lager, but kind of, yeah, I haven't really seen much of uh, Phillips and to really judge him with Lagerbeck as well. But for throughout the weekend, I definitely think um, Phillips and uh, Scales. But Liam Scales, he's, he's 25, which is obviously not, not that young in your football career nowadays. But he's quite young in the level he's kind of played at. He's only played in the SPFL, obviously, the last two seasons. He was mm -hmm. in Ireland, obviously, before that. And he only really played one or two seasons at the top tier in Ireland. So he's kind of still very young in his, his own development. And I think saying that he doesn't have much of a high ceiling, he obviously he could drop out now when Naraki and Cardovacus come Cardovacus come back, but I think he's shown that he can he can go up a level. And um I think as he is quite young in his, his football and career in terms of the levels he's played at, I think maybe he could have another few gears to go up again and this is all hypothetical, of course. We just have to we'll have to see the proof in the pudding whether he can whether he can go up that level and, and compete with Naraki and Carter Bridges when they come back. Yeah. The, 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 also, I think just to just to butt in, sorry, Paul, that if they're all fit, unless Phillips is an outstanding player, an outstanding player, then you don't play him. Why would you play him? He's not a player. You've spent money on Lager Bielke, you've spent money on Narovsky, Carter Vickers is your is your rock. Phillips doesn't play. He's he's fourth or fifth choice now. Because why would you play? Unless he was an exceptional player and he was going to raise our standards up to a certain level. But in the evidence, what I've seen so far, they're all much of a muchness. So I don't think yeah. Phillips gets a game at all when they're all fit. Why would you do that? Why would you develop someone else's player when you've got your own players to develop and you've spent money on them? Mm -hmm. No, and, and obviously coming back to fitness, you're right. For me, the, the leapfrog. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how skills his career goes because it's about longevity. How long can you keep that uh, running for? Is he going to be coming... Uh, a, a kind of squad player in the same mould as Tony Ralston, whereby you do trust that we now have a backup there um, should you require it. Because I am pretty confident in Ralston if, if, if Johnson is injured, which he has been, um, for you know Ralston to step in as, as a number two. If that is the role for skills, then great, because that's actually better than quite a lot of people expected at the beginning of the season, uh, where folk were expecting him to move on. Uh, there was a mention earlier on about the Celtic women's team, and I did mention that obviously they've started off really well. 2 1 win against Glasgow City last night. Chloe Craig and um, Colette Kavanagh as well scoring the goals. Top of the league, eight wins on the bounce. Fran Alonso, top man. But I need to say also that uh, Natasha Mikkel, Axom's very own, is up for an award at the uh, Football Content Awards. Axom is up for two other awards as well, and the link to vote is underneath this video. Natasha is up for the best in women's football. She is a, a massive supporter um, of the game. She exposes it to a wide audience on our social media channels and, of course, talks about it on Axom as well. So if you fancy giving us a wee fitty up, get into that voting section on the link underneath. Vote for Natasha, best in women's. Vote for Axom, best club content creator international, and vote for Axom. Best podcast international. Fitty up. Fitty up. Fitty up. A, a fitty up. It's a, it's a, a fighting expression. 
Oh, I thought it was a worldwide renowned <laughs> term. No, Lloyd, what do you think of that? Fitty up. Lloyd. So you're going to nah, jump over a nah, wall. Nah, you're going to jump nah. over a wall, right? You're going to jump over a wall. Say you're going to the St. Rocks game, which is completely sold out, and you're going to try and jump over the wall. Okay, let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. Why are we jumping over I just say a leg up. A leg up, right? A fitty up, right? So you put your two hands together, and then somebody can stand, right? So we used to call it a fitty up. Did you call it a leg up? Leg up. We're international and continental on Axom. We go from... You know, we go from ja Japan to Australia to Swindon. I'm actually trying to think that far back. What was it called back in the day? Back in the 60s, what did we call these things? I don't know. A leg wasn't up, a fitty up, up anyway. Was it not a fitty up? It wasn't a leg up either. There's so many old sometimes. I'm maybe shufty, thinking of... Shufty rings a bit with me, but I'm not sure that's the right one either. Over to right, the chat room. See what the chat yeah, room What do you call it? Is it Something a like red... Something like Red Scotland, we know this kind of stuff. That's this kind of stuff. That's, he's he's he doing my either, I think. Nah, he would. Red, Let us know. What do we call it? What do you a call punty it? Up, something like that. Punty up, maybe? Something like that. I don't know. Anyway. There you go. That's a big talking point today. The big talking point is. today. Yeah, yeah. Claire, it's unfortunate you can't join us um, for Chris Sutton tonight, but uh, it's always great to see you at the live events, and we're going to have loads more to uh, enjoy in the future. So thank you for the good luck message. I'm looking forward, as always, to speaking to Chris Sutton. I think he's great. He's going to absolutely tear me to shreds. As always, Marcus, find it a bit odd that O'Reilly can't get into the Denmark squad. I think his time will come. Just a bit a bit of patience. Remember, we spoke to Morton Vcourse, one of the, the the players from the, the squad that stopped the 10, Jim. Spoke to him a few months yeah. back, and yeah. even then he was talking about the fact that the national coaches watching O'Reilly with interest. So I think it's coming. It will happen. Pablo 67 would start, would you start Turnbull on Saturday? Well, again, it goes back to the point Jim was making. How do you keep these players ticking along? Quan, Quan has played one game of football, Lloyd, this season. He's played one game and it was a testimonial against their United at Somerset Park. How is he going to be fit? Matt Sharp, how is he going to develop? Well, the answer is he's not. He's going to stagnate, isn't he? Um, and Turnbull, obviously, he's on the bench and he's, he's played some game time. But at the moment, I don't think he's a starter for Celtic. But you've got to manage your squad as well as manage your starting 11. So a game like Kilmarnock, do you look at it and think, well, if we're winning and it's comfortable enough, now, obviously, comfortable enough to most people's 2 nothing to Jim or it's 3 nothing, right? At least 3, yeah. At, At least, least three. 3. At least 3. Do you then bring on David Turnbull? Do you, you've got to keep giving these guys minutes, don't you? Or they will stagnate. Yeah, it's that comes down to good squad management. If you're going to start bringing these guys on, maybe one 2 nothing up, maybe try and win the game. Turnbull, on the other hand, he's he started the season well and then he's kind of just slowly fallen back to the bench. So it's kind of interesting where he's going to become the end of the season because obviously his contract's running down as well so you would kind of hope mm -hmm. he would be fighting Hattati or O'Reilly for a jersey but I don't see anything like that coming, coming at all it's just I think he is now stagnated at Celtic sadly and I think come January there will be a move for David Turnbull It is a shame right because he's undoubtedly talented Jim he's a player that if there was another David Turnbull in Scottish football right now we'd be looking at him even with the age that he is now and he's been at the club for about three years he was very unfortunate in the the timing of breaking into the side when we were really poor under Neil Lennon in the final season. Um, continuing that progress under Ange and then getting that injury in the semi-final, of the, or was it the final rather, of the League Cup. And then he just couldn't get back in the side because we brought in Hitati and we brought in O'Reilly at that stage. I think he's been very, very unlucky. But as Lloyd quite rightly says, he's a guy who will have aspirations to play international football. He needs to play games. And if he doesn't get those games, unfortunately for Turnbull, and unfortunately for us as well, I think he might leave. He might leave the building. I think the manager likes him. The manager's played him this season. He scored a few goals. I think he's further up the pecking order than your Holmes or your Bernardo. So if if, if he does make a change from Atati, maybe Turnbull's not the most likely player to, to maybe, maybe come in. He takes a shot from distance as well. And I think, again, because we've been playing, and maybe more players on the park you can maybe do that. So I, I wouldn't be averse to David Turnbull playing tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, as you said, that's that's the kind of balance that the manager's got, trying to keep all these people happy. Uh, and he's somebody who should be playing a lot more football. And if you're a football player, it's a short short career. You want to go in that park and sit in a dugout. Or you, you train all week and then it comes to the game and you're sitting in a dugout and you, you get the last 10 minutes or whatever it's going to be. And uh, again, go back to the Beckham thing, they were talking to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer about him coming on for the last 10 minutes, the Champions League final. 
Mm. And they were saying, well, how do you feel coming on? So it's about time I come on. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting on the bench waiting to get on. Of course it's about time I come on. But yeah, players just want to play football. And uh, if you're a football player, you want to go in that park as, as long as you can. And if you've got a talent like David Turnbull, uh, he should be in the Scotland team as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. You know, And he will be pals with some of the guys who went down south here, Kieran Tierney, and Stuart Armstrong, as was mentioned earlier. You know what these guys are on? They're playing in the biggest of us. The most fashionable league in the world, there's tons of money down there, and he's sitting on the bench. So, again, psychologically, football players, you know, it's a kind of we seem to look at it, think it must be a glamorous lifestyle. But if you're, if, you're, if you're not playing week after week after week, then you're kind of you know twirling your thumbs, it's not that clever, demoralizing, absolutely. Demoralizing. Demoralizing. And the one player I remember asking the question of, and I, I maybe should have known better, was Paddy McCourt. And I said to Paddy about the Barcelona game, the famous 2-1 victory at Celtic Park. And we had just celebrated our 125th anniversary with a big mass down at St Mary's the night before. We go out there, we play the best team in the world and we beat them 2-1. On the bench is Paddy McCourt. And I said to him, Lloyd, I said, Paddy, were you just sitting there dying to get on the park? You know, were you just itching to get on? And he was like, nah, I was quite enjoying just watching it. <laughs> and he was not interested about getting a, getting in on the action. Uh, one of the most famous victories in Celtic's history. But there you go. There's there's the bold Paddy. Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure um, over the last hour to talk all things Celtic to um, a live audience of 800 plus at any given time, which is fantastic on a Friday afternoon. Big shout out to everybody else who joins us over the next 72 hours or so. And hopefully we can enjoy the weekend and another victory against Kilmarnock. If you're coming along to Chris Sutton tonight, I will see you there. Really looking forward to that. Uh, no other tickets available for that, the St. Rocks game or the triple header at the end of the month with Pierre, George Cadet and Annie Tom. Uh, but hopefully we'll announce another event very, very soon for November or December. All that's left for me to say thanks, everybody, for your support, as always, and thank you to Lloyd, Jim, and also to James for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Cheers, Paul.